Everybody can see uh, see my browser, right? Okay, great. Um, so like Ryan said, I thought we were like in week 30. So I was like week 30-ish, question mark. I, so I don't know. I've lost all track of time. I mean, I was looking outside and it was snow the last time we, <laughs> when we started. So it's, uh, and now it's like 100 degree days. But anyways, uh, tonight we're going to talk about chapter 28, graphics for communication. Um, basically, we're going to kind of cover some of the stuff that we've already covered, but really what we're going to do is we're going to discuss uh, kind of final touches on our graphics that we put together using ggplot. So that's kind of our main focus. I don't know if you want to do an icebreaker. We're kind of already at the five minutes, but um, this was the icebreaker that I have. I know Ryan said we were going to take maybe about a two to three week break because some people are traveling and everything. So I guess, oh, why not? Let's do it. Yeah. Uh, what What are you looking forward to most during our break? <laughs> I'm I'm cutting out for a vacation, so um, I'm I'm taking the family to Montana, and we'll be there from uh, for for almost two weeks. So I'm super excited. Big sky country, never yeah. been. Yeah. So. yeah. Who else? I don't know. It's hard for me because I just came from break. <laughs> <laughs> So, so it's hard for me, but I'll be looking forward to restarting. <laughs> That'd be great. Awesome. Monso, what about yourself? I feel sad. I, <laughs> I don't think I have a break. <laughs> <laughs> I have just work lined up. I have to go to India for collecting plants and yeah. I, I, I don't see any break in sight. <laughs> more work, more work. Just just wait till you have to do, do you have to do comprehensive exams for your PhD? Yeah, so I just give, did my, I finished my exam. We have yearly committee meetings. So I got done with that last week. So yeah, that was I... always my favorite. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> that's always, that's always my favorite. I remember sitting in a room for like four days, three hours straight. That was just, yeah, regurgitating what was in my mind. So anyways, well, uh, good luck with that. So uh, I guess the thing for me is I'm just going to kind of take a break and kind of chill for a little bit. So um, enjoy the nice weather because it's been beautiful out for a while. So, oh, we're going to the College World Series. So if anybody knows baseball, going to go to baseball this weekend. So um, where is that? Is that there in Nebraska? It's in Omaha. Oh, nice. So, yep, it's been going on for the past couple of weeks. So I'm a huge baseball fan. So um, cool. Awesome. Great to hear everybody has some plans after that. We'll talk more about what we plan to do um, maybe in like two, three weeks, but um, we'll kind of get that discussion a little bit later, but let's kind of dig into some of this. We already know these. I'm not going to, we've been here for 30 weeks, so I'm not going to spend too much time here, but the big one to highlight again is if you need me to slow down, just let me know. We can talk about things. Um, if you have a question, most likely someone else has that same question. So please ask it. Uh, so tonight's discussion, we're going to talk about chapter 28, graphics for communication. Specifically, we're going to talk about labels and annotations. We're going to talk about scales. We're talking about zooming, themes, and saving plots. And really, we've kind of talked about a lot of this stuff. So I'm going to kind of like do some examples um, using some of the data, data that we've used before while also talking kind of like bigger picture a little bit as well. Um, so really the goal of this chapter was it's just kind of to try and learn how to make good graphics. Now, I say good because really what we're going to learn is we're going to learn the mechanics behind it. So this chapter is really talking about the mechanics. It really doesn't get into, you know, I'm in this certain situation. I have this kind of data. This is the best way to um, communicate it. Rather, it's more about talking about the mechanics that you need to do many different types of things so that you can reach your kind of goal that you're trying to do with your final plots that you're going to try and communicate out. And so uh, really, it kind of comes down to this is that learning how to generate good graphics takes work and experience. And really, it kind of comes down to one, knowing your data, working with your data, um, and then being able to kind of have the experience to know what types of plots are available for me to actually communicate what I'm trying to communicate with my analysis. 
And so the book really talks about kind of four different resources. Uh, I've read a couple of these. Uh, the Truthful Art, this was the book suggestion. I haven't really read this before, but it is available if you want it. The other one is the GG Plot 2 book. Now the book says it's for sale, but I've kind of found it online here. So this might be materials that you can read through, look through it. Um, and then the extension gallery. So if you are in a situation where you don't have a geome that would work or you don't have a specific plot that ggplot has, it's a great place to kind of look at this extension gallery because there's many different extensions that people have written for GG, ggplot too. Uh, here's another shameless plug. Um, for many of you, you've noticed or I've mentioned it before, I teach a class in, um, it's kind of a data journalism class, but it's more spoke, focused on sports data. Uh, the professor that I work with on this, he wrote an entire book um, kind of going over many different types of like analysis and visualization that you can do with sports data. And it's really, really well put together. And this book, the main focus of it is to try and teach journalists to code in R to create these visualizations. So it's really, it's, it's very accessible. It doesn't kind of dig into the deepness of it. It's more of like, hey, you have this type of data. Here's a type of plot you can create. So it's pretty accessible. Like I said, it's just a shameless plug um, for the work that Matt Waite did. Super smart individual, super smart guy. Put this together and it's really kind of interesting to kind of see different types of plots that you can put together. So I highly suggest this as another resource to look at. So sorry for the shameless plug. <laughs> I wrote a chapter in it, so I, I have to I have to plug it whenever I can. So really, we want to talk about the goal of what we're trying to do with these kind of finishing touches with our plots. Before we were kind of talking about creating plots to our to explore data. And when we're in that kind of exploration, that EDA mode, our plots are really trying to focus on generating a general awareness of all of our variables and trying to get some summary information about them. What do they look like? What types of variables do we have? What are the distributions? Um, what can we do? What are the means or the median or what are the medians, the measures of central tendency, all kinds of stuff. And so that's kind of the exploratory part. In this phase with our plots, we're trying to get those quick iterations, trying to get a lot of prototyping. And so usually in this type of analysis with our plots, we're creating hundreds, if not thousands. And so a main kind of goal of trying to use this when we're in this exploration mode is we're trying to verify our assumptions, make sure the data looks correct, you know, making sure that there's no issues with it. But this chapter really kind of moves us into the communicating data portion of it, trying to share our analysis with others. And when I mean this, when we're trying to share, it may be trying to share with people who don't have that nuanced understanding that we have of the data. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to communicate to somebody else who probably has no knowledge of this data. So thinking of your, super, your supervisor, your advisor, a client, whoever it may be, um, you're really trying to kind of shift into that mode of communicating the most important information. So here you're trying to establish a quick understanding of the data. So trying to give a broad overview of it. You're trying to establish a standalone graphic. So one thing that we teach in our class, and again, it's more data journalist focused, is trying to get that graphic or that plot to tell a story. And so can that story or that plot stand by itself without any extra explanation? And so we'll kind of talk about some of the mechanics with that. And then, um, the, the biggest thing between this transition is, is that you can sink a lot of time into this finishing touches portion. So this portion, I would say, is not really good for like your exploratory stuff, but it's kind of the finishing touches stuff. But you can really, you can really sink a lot of time into this kind of portion. So it's really good to kind of have a plan when you're kind of focusing on this. Now, I, I the book really doesn't talk about this, but I think this is kind of an important conversation that we need to have um, when you think about creating plots for communication. I'm traditionally uh, trained as a communication scholar. That's what I got my master's and my PhD in. And so there's three basic questions you want to ask yourself anytime that you're thinking about communicating your analysis through the use of, of data visualizations. And this is just a very summarized portion of it, but 
really ask yourself, who is your audience? Who are you trying to reach? The more information you could get about, about your audience, the better chance you're gonna to have to reach your kind of general goal of your analysis. So are you trying to inform somebody about a certain analysis that you've done, about a certain theory or anything? Are you trying to persuade them to do some certain action? Or, I mean, are you trying to entertain people? In my case today, I'm trying to uh, inform you while also entertaining you as well. So really kind of think about who is your audience and kind of what's that general goal? Now, again, with data analysis, you want to be as accurate as possible, and you want to make sure that your, your analysis is valid and accurate. But at the same time, when you're trying to communicate, you kind of want to figure out, okay, what am I trying to do? Am I trying to inform somebody? Am I trying to persuade somebody? Am I trying to entertain? Or is it a mix of those three? And then really think about what are your specific goals? What are you trying to get out of it? Um, when I think about my supervisor, yeah, we could put a survey together, but I know there's two or three questions that she wants to know. And so I really try and focus on what are my specific goals when thinking about trying to create um, some final plots that I want to communicate. So some of the packages that were discussed in the chapter, um, ggplot shouldn't be new to anybody. Um, ggrepl might be new to some people, but uh, ggrepl is a really, uh, a really good package to kind of, or is a package of tools that allow you to label plots. Um, the book talks about genome text, which we'll get about here in a second, or genome label. But I think ggrepl is a little bit better in certain situations. And I'll be honest, I don't 100% know how to pronounce this. So uh, viridi or viridi, um, you know, someone could uh, tweet me and, and correct my pronunciation, but these are tools to make graphics more accessible, specifically regarding like color scales. So um, we'll talk a little bit about changing your scaling of your colors to make sure that you are making it accessible um, because there are some people that uh, are um, colorblind. And so that's something to take into consideration when you're putting your plots together. And this is a, a good package to kind of focus on having a good uh, scale of colors to use. So let's talk a little bit about anatomy of a plot. Um, I'm not gonna dig too much into this, but really what we're gonna be really focusing on is how do we add these six different elements to our plots? And really what we're trying to focus on is, we call it a headline in the class that they teach. It's your title, but we think of it as the headline. Um, but then we have our, our chatter here, which kind of gives more information about the plot and the data that you're seeing. This is going to be your subtitle. You can add a label here. Um, in ggplot, it really doesn't add a label too much. But annotations, really kind of drawing your audience's attention to the most important information or to give them information about specific points within the data. The all-important source line. So where did you get your data? When was your data updated? Um, when did you access your data? And then the credit line. Uh, you may not have a credit line in your visualization, but if you're going to be sharing on Twitter or you're going to be sharing it on your blog, give yourself some credit, do a byline, because if, if somebody picks it up, you want to make sure that you get credit for yourself. So it's always good to have a byline as well. So let's talk a little bit about how do we go about adding labels to plots. And really the one function that does a lot of the heavy lifting to add the title, the subtitle, the caption is the labs function. And we've already kind of seen the labs function, so I'm not gonna to spend too much time talking about it. But really what you have is you have different arguments within labs that allow you to set those specific portions of your plot. So your title, pretty self-explanatory, you can put your title. So you can name your plot, my cool title. I think there's a kind of important conversation about this is, is that when you put your title together, you really want to try and create a title that summarizes the main finding and avoids being descriptive. Uh, you know, avoid those things where it says like the relationship between miles per gallon versus uh, displacement. Snore, boring, I want to go to sleep. Um, you know, kind of jazz it up a little bit, you know, have some type of strong verb in there, try and get it to kind of tell a story. So avoid those kind of descriptive titles if you can. Again, that's dependent on your audience, though. If you're speaking to a more academic audience or you're writing in an academic journal, 
you may have to use that descriptive kind of, of uh, title, but just think about your audience a little bit when you're kind of putting that together. So do you need to add more info? So you can add your subtitle with the kind of argument within labs that will add just right underneath the title. And then your caption will be kind of like the bottom source of where you're putting that information. And then you can label your X, Y. And then if you have a third variable, you can um, add such things as color. And so I'm gonna bring in my first kind of example for tonight doing titles. Uh, you should be pretty familiar with this. So all we're gonna do is we're just gonna look at miles per gallon. We're gonna look at our MPG data. I first have to change cylinder to factor because it's, it's an integer. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna add these titles to it. So, ooh, sorry about that. And let's run this. So here you go. You can see we have our title. We have our subtitle, we have our X and our Y, our, our Y and our X, and then we have our colors. And so you can kind of match where each of these ones go. Um, here's your source line as well. Um, the other thing that was discussed about in the book is when you label your X and Y, make them descriptive, you know, um, try and avoid or make them descriptive as possible. So try and avoid um, like abbreviations uh, so if I did this by itself, it would be like HWY for highway mileage. It makes a lot more sense and it's easier to read if you put highway mileage, MPG. Okay, it's pretty intuitive, but it just adds more information, makes it easier for your audience to um, read it, understand what's being conveyed here. Okay. I think we're pretty well up on the titles and stuff. So quick question, spend... uh, quick yeah. that, though. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm guessing that maybe there's options if you wanted like smaller fonts or larger fonts or anything like that, or, or what if you wanted your subtitle to be even smaller, say? Yeah, that's good. I was kind of like going back and forth if I want to talk about that because the book briefly talks about themes, but you can. Uh, so what you would do is you would add theme at the bottom and then you would do, um, you could do not access title. I always got to look these up, but you could do like, bear with me, but there's options to do it. So let me pull over my R session. We can look at it real quick, but yeah, there's ways to like change it and get as nuanced as you want. So let me do a question mark here. Let's go themes. Do you want to change the theme in general? I think he wants to change the individual like uh, title. And then the yeah, subtitle. Like, yeah, just like one aspect of it. Uh -huh. So, um, and you can see how many different options there are. So like, I think it's going to be plot.title. So you can go plot.title. And then you would do like plot.title uh, element text, oops, text, test text. And then you would do size equals 16, face equals bold. So you can do that. There's many different options with themes, but now it looks a little bit better, right? So now you have that text hierarchy where this is 16 and this is smaller. I was kind of on the fence if I want to talk about themes and the individual theme stuff because the book really doesn't talk about it. But yeah, you can pretty much change anything within this plot. Uh, yeah, that's good enough. I, I get, yeah, I get the idea that it's not, uh, it's not an argument of the, um, of the line. What do you have above the theme? It's the, it's the labs. It's not an argument of the, of one of the labs elements. It's a separate theme. Yep, it's okay. a separate theme. Yep, there's different options in theme, and and too, if you go like, if you go into your R session and go question mark theme. Yeah. It will pull up all the different things that you can do, and there's a lot because there's a lot of different elements in a ggplot, so. Excellent question. Like I said, I was on the fence about that, but again, this looks a lot better because now you have this nice text hierarchy and you can see my strong verb plummets with bigger engines. So keeping it more attention grabbing tells more of the story. Okay, oh, let's jump over here. So let's talk about annotations. Oh, if you need a, if you need a math formula, you'll have to use this function called quote. Uh, I'm, I don't do any work that's sophisticated where I need to have a mathematical formula on my plot, but if you do, 
the options there. So let's talk about adding annotations. Um, annotate, annotations label those individual or groups of observations. So it really kind of clears up some more information that's on your plot. So are you trying to talk about a specific subset of data? Are you trying to highlight one single point? That's where annotations come into play. And so there's um, three different ways to do this that the book talks about. It talks about geome text, talks about geome label, and it talks about geome label REPL. To be honest, in my experience, I think REPL, and this is my opinion, I think REPL's better, but you also have kind of the base options of doing geome label and geome text. And I have some examples to show what each of them do. Um, but how we actually do annotations is there's two different ways. Uh, the first way and kind of the most common way is you have to kind of create your own separate data or you have to create your own separate tibble of the subset of data that you want to add onto your plot. The other way is, is to try and label just one single place or one single point on your plot using one single data point as well. But the most common way that I know how to do it and that I've seen is having that separate tibble. So let me kind of jump over to my example here. So for some fun tonight, what I basically was going to do is I'm going to look at the uh, MPG data and I'm specifically going to look at the 1999 Dodge Caravan. Just a wonderful minivan, uh, solid, gives you two options, three, four speed automatic. You have three different engine options, a 2.4 liter, a 3.0, and then a V6 3.8 ranging between 150, 180, 180 horsepower. Got that three trim level with the base SE and LE uh, with different ratings for Edmunds, cars.com and KBB, all ranging above 3.5 to a four out of five. Just a solid vehicle, okay? Uh, here's an example of what a 1999 Dodge Caravan looks like. Or, <laughs> so um, we're gonna look at this one specifically uh, within the MPG data while also still applying. Um, just a solid vehicle. I think in another life, I was probably a, a used car salesperson, but um, anyways, hopefully I'll, I'll convince you to buy a Dodge Caravan now. Um, excellent ratings, by the way. Um, okay, so need to stop doing a tangent here and, and have a real conversation. So let's talk a little bit about adding geome text. So if we're going to add text labels, so in our data, if we look at the MPG data, you'll notice that there is several Dodge Caravans represented in this data. Um, there's different different um, displacements. And anytime I say displacement, just think of it as like the size of the engine and then the year. So they have two different years. They have the 1999 and the 2008. And what I'm basically going to do is I want to look at and label just Dodge Caravans in our data set so we can see them. So what I have to do is I have to create a separate tibble of just the caravan specific data. And so I achieve that with um, my filter statement here. I do some like text stuff here so that we can label the different years for the different caravans, but that's all this does here is it just creates 1999 caravan, 2008, so on and so forth. So if I want to do that, we can run this geome text with this setting our mapping through our aesthetic using label and what's important is that we have to reference the specific data object in this geome text. If you do not put this here, it's not going to work. So if you have a separate subset of data that you have to label, you have to reference it with data equals. And you have to do data equals. Because if you don't do data equals, it still won't work. So if you run this, now I have some labeling. Obviously, you can see the issue. It's pretty intuitive. Can't read it. If I sent this to my supervisor, they would say, this is a terrible plot. Doesn't mean anything to me. I really, I really, really want to know what the 1999 Dodge Caravan can do. Okay, well, let's move on. Let's do a geome label. A geome label outside of geome text will draw a label around it. So nothing really changes. The only thing that we change is this geome underscore label. So we'll run this. Okay, a little better, a little bit better, can kind of see it, but what's the issue? And I know this is pretty intuitive, but what's the issue here? 
they're all overlapping. All overlapping. Yeah, they're all overlapping. And so that's the limitation of geome text and geome label is that they're all overlapping. That's the problem. So geome text or geome, uh, excuse me. So the ggrepl package has a function called geome label repl and geome text repl that does an algorithm that spreads these out randomly. And so you can see them better. And so that's why I'm kind of in the camp of the geome label REPL outside of geome text and geome, uh, geome label is because it allows you to kind of shift things around and it gives you options to kind of shift things around a little bit better. So we have the same plot here, <clears throat> but what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the geome label REPL here. Let's run this so we can kind of look at it. You can see how the algorithm on the back end, it kind of separated these out. And so it made it easier to read. Now it's still kind of hiding some of the points. So what we can do is we can use some of the options provided by Ge Geom Label REPL, like nudge Y, nudge X, to kind of change things around so that we can move them. So if I wanted to, I could shove them all the way to the right. Um, if I don't like this, I can just do Geom Text. Geom Text will just be the text labels. To be honest, when I do labeling, I use Geom Text REPL quite a bit, but you know, whatever suits you. Any questions about Geom Text? I know this is some pretty, pretty intuitive stuff, but I will be honest that where I sink a lot of time is with annotations. If I'm creating a plot, it's the annotations because it's just never perfect, it never works. And so I have to kind of sit around and play around with like, okay, how far do I nudge it Y? How far do I nudge it X? So you can sink a lot of time into annotations. My biggest, my biggest bit of advice is just find one that works and walk away <laughs> because you can sink a lot of time into just making it look perfect. Um, some other things that you can do with this as well. Um, you can add reference lines, which I have an example for this. I usually sometimes I usually use the H line and V line to highlight means or summary statistics in some way, especially if I'm have like a scatter plot. And then um, you also have geom rect, which will draw a rectangle. Um, to be a hundred percent honest, I think that geom n circle is a it's from the GG alt package, but it allows you to draw a circle. And um, I think this one's a little bit better. We could talk a little bit about it a little bit later, but you can actually draw a circle rather than a box. So that one works pretty well. And then geom segment, um, you can draw arrows. I really haven't used geom segment, but if you want to draw a specific arrow, you sure can use that. So let's talk about drawing some reference lines in here and say, say somebody's interested in the, the 1999 Dodge Caravan and they want to see how it compares to all cars within that data set. Well, the first thing that we have to do is we have to calculate those averages. <coughs> Excuse me. So here, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna use a summarize to calculate the highway average and then the displacement average. Again, anytime I say displacement, it's just the size of the engine. So here I create a separate tibble. We can look at it just to verify it. You can see that for this data set, the average highway mileage is 23 miles per the gallon. The average displacement is 3.4. Um, and then what I want to do is I want to label that 1999 Dodge Caravan. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to filter out for that two-wheel drive four-cylinder. Um, obviously, there's more models that you could have for that specific car, but I'm just interested in that um, just that 2.4 liter V4. And that's what I want to look at. So if we look at this, it's just one data object. Now we have multiple data objects that we can use to label our plot. And so what we're going to do is in my geome text REPL, and just as a quick question, does anybody, what data object do I need if I wanted to label just that one point for that vehicle? What's the data object that I need to use? Anyone want to take a guess? 
Yeah, if you go back to Caravan 1999. That's correct, because I want that one data point. It's Caravan 1999. Now, what I'm going to do is if I want to put like a horizontal line and a vertical line, I'm going to use this GM H line and GM B line. And because I have this separate data object with our different average mile per gallon, now what I can do is I can plot a line, a vertical line or a horizontal line on those specific spaces. And now I've split my, my scatter plot into four different sections. And what's nice about that is I can tell even more of the story by adding some geome text to it to kind of tell people, hey, if a car is in this quadrant, it means this. If a car is in this quadrant, it means this. And so that's what this genome text does. Um, I'm also going to add some labs in here. You'll see that here in a second. So let's put this all together. Let's look at it with some reference lines. There you go. There's your plot. So looking at this, can anybody tell me, can anybody tell me what type of vehicle is the 1999 Dodge Caravan 2.4 liter. What do you think? Well, besides being a beautiful vehicle, it looks like it is a, uh, a small engine with medium gas mileage. Yeah, I would say it's average gas mileage. Yeah. And that's basically what I say here in the title. It guzzles gas on the highway like most cars. You know, it's it's a reliable vehicle, but it's not one of those, you know, geo metros that you're going to get 50 miles per the gallon. So it's not a hybrid. But if you're in the market, a 2020 uh, in 2021 KBB valuation of a 1999 Dodge Caravan, KBB, Kelly Blue Book, it's just a way to get values of cars. You're looking at 558 to 1253 dollars. But anyways, if you're looking for a car that's about average but has a small engine, this might be your car. That's something to think about. Uh, is it the best? No, absolutely not. But it's about average. So there might be some other values to to that vehicle as well. Carries a lot of people. But anyways, uh, I I want to look back at the code real quick because I noticed that sure. the the the, um, the reference lines. Um, you had to specify exactly where you wanted those, right? X, you had to give it an X value. Oh, so the reference line, so the H line and the V line. Yeah. Okay. So there, uh, yeah, X intercept, MVG average. Okay. So basically what I'm doing here is we have the data object MPG average, yep. which is this table up here that we yep. created. And then we're just subsetting it with a dollar sign. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, if you wanted to, what you could do is you could um, just take, get these values and then actually plug in the actual value if you wanted to. Right, right, right. right. And so you have a GG plot line in 124. That gives you, that's all of the data, line 124. And then plus, and then you move on and you do a point, yep, gray with alpha plus then it's just the Dodge Caravan, it's another layer, and then plus, and then all the labels plus. Okay, cool, got it. So uh, here's a question, and this one's a good one to think about it. Um, thinking about this one specific Dodge Caravan, well, the, this plot, how many points are there technically for that Dodge Caravan, that 1999 Dodge Caravan? Technically. I mean, I think though, because we are overlapping. That's right. There's technically two because we're layering them onto each other. So um, you're going to have the original point. So you have gray and then you'll have this second point, which is blue, but it doesn't matter because visually they're just overlapping. It would matter though, if you change the alpha to like this, to being like super, you know, where it lets a lot of light in through it then you'll see both those points and you got to take that into consideration that you do technically have two points on this data set. But I'm doing this because I want to highlight, my, you know, my story is I want to tell the story of the 1999 2.4 liter Dodge Caravan. So um, the other thing that I wanted to highlight that I didn't mention with this too, 
is something that I found useful. And this is just more of a professional thing for me is like, anytime you have a source line right here, we'll always include a source because people always ask, Hey, where'd you get this data? Okay. Here's where I got the data. The other thing that I found very useful is <clears throat> put the date that the plot was created because there's always times where I find myself, like if I'm looking through an old report and I sit there and I'm like, okay, when did I run this report? Did I run it in 2019, 2020? Okay, I can easily figure out where this plot came from. The other thing too, is if you pass this on to somebody else who's gonna be reading it, like a supervisor or your advisor or whoever it may be, they can look at it and understand, oh, this was 2018, this is outdated. Let's run a new report. So just another tip that I found kind of useful with captions. Well, okay, can... go, go ahead. So, how, uh, so in the entire talk, you only have a one dot and then you mark it blue. How did you do that? So you can think of it as layers. So here's the section of that code that does this. So this first one, it's going to, it's going to plot all of the, all of the, <clears throat> all of the cars in each one. Mm -hmm. And then this individual blue one is a separate data object that I've created up here called Caravan 1999, oh, right here. I see, I see. And then we did it here. Again, the big important, important thing here is, is that you have a separate data object and that you refer to it as data equals Caravan 1999. And again, you have to do data equals that or else it's not gonna work. Mm -hmm. So good question. Excellent question. Cool. Any other questions? This stuff is fun because you get like you actually you're actually telling the story of your data with this stuff. And again, but again, the other thing is you can sink a lot of time into it too. So it's just kind of a trade-off. Um, so let's talk about adjusting scales. Uh, remember, this is direct quote from the book: scales control the mapping from data values to things that we that that we can perceive. And so we have the ability to either transform or replace these scale values. Now, the book kind of talks about these three default function families. There is a wide range of them. So we just don't have enough time to cover all of them. But the ones that you'll most likely run into are going to be the scale X, the scale Y, and the scale color. If you want the um, American English version, you can do C-O-L-O-R if you want to. Um, but with these, you can specify the type of data object or the type of, of data that you have for each scale. So you can have things like scale X continuous, you can have scale X discrete, scale X date time, scale X date. So you can just pretty much take continuous and put it in scale X continuous, so on and so forth. <clears throat> Again, there's many different ways to kind of transform your type of scaling, but the ones that you'll kind of most run across is this X, Y color using continuous discrete daytime or date. So, so let's see, I think, oh, some reasons why you might adjust the scales. Again, this is like your X and your Y. How are you representing the values within it? Um, the reasons why you might want to adjust this is maybe you want to adjust the breaks. You know, maybe you have a plot that goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Rather than showing all of those values of one through ten, you just want to show the evens: two, four, six, eight, ten. Okay. Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can replace the scale using some other calculation. So, if you need to do a log transformation for some reason to better represent the relationship of your data, you have the flexibility to do that as well. So. Um, the way to do this is using those scale X continuous, those scale Y continuous to scale colors. The two arguments that you need to know are breaks and labels. <clears throat> breaks control the position of ticks or values associated with our specific keys in the plot. Our labels control the text. So what actually gets written. So the way I think about it is breaks are position, labels what actually gets written is how I kind of think of it. And I have an example to share. Yeah, let's talk about that now. So I have an example to quickly discuss that real quick. Here's our scaling examples. All this is pretty much the same. Still looking at the Dodge Caravan, but what I wanna do is I wanna change 
these, um, the continuous variables. Our X value is continuous, our Y value is continuous. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna change the breaks here. Now, does anybody wanna tell me, thinking about the Y axis, and we'll just look at it here, just looking at the arguments, what's gonna happen to my Y axis with this breaks argument that I set and by argument? What's going to happen here? I think you're going to lose some of the bottom, maybe the lowest value, because it's going to start at 15, right? And then go up to 40. So you're going to lose the lowest and the highest. Yep. Values. Yep. And then how are these going to be represented? Yeah. By counting by fives. Is that what it says? By yep. equal. Yeah. Multiples of fives. Yep. Correct. And then same thing here breaks for X is going to be two, four, six. How are these going to be represented though? What's actually going to get printed to the plot? Only two, four, six. Yep, two, four, six. And not only are they going to be two, four, six, I'm going to do it. I'm going to append a two L, four L, six L. So the actual string value to it. Still going to represent the same, but I'm just representing the labels differently. So now I have two liter, four liter, six liter rather than two, four, six or two, four, two, four, five, six or whatever it was. But you can append a string value in here if you wanted to. <clears throat> so just a way to kind of do that. Um, you can also replace the scale. So if you need to do like a log transform, I haven't done a log transform in a while, but your data may necessitate it. Um, you can change that. So if you need to better represent this relationship, you can just use the function, you know, scale y log, scale x log, and you could just do the transformation here. And now this is represented in logs rather than what it was before. Okay. Um, go ahead. Somebody have a question? Oh, no, I was just saying that the graph looks very nice. <laughs> yeah, now I, well, oh, the other thing that I changed was the color because now I add class to it. Uh, so there's different colors and we'll talk about how to change those colors a little bit here in a second. Um, let's see here. Oh, so zooming. So say you want to like zoom into a certain section of the plot. Uh, the book kind of talks about three methods to do this. <clears throat> you can either adjust your data. You can either set your limits for each scale or you can set the limits using chord Cartesian. Now I put a warning here, the method that you choose is gonna dictate if your data is subsetted, okay? So the book suggests that if you are gonna do zooming on your plot, you should use the function chord Cartesian and then set the arguments within that to zoom. And I'll show you an example of that, of why that is the case. But, um, Oh, shoot, I forgot to talk about these um, for scaling. We'll talk about this and we'll go back to that, that idea here in a second. <clears throat> but the other thing you can do with your scaling too is rather than changing the, the actual values, you can change the colors as well. As well. So here's an example of scale color brewer. Um, basically what we're doing is we're just changing it using a certain palette. So scale color brewer, what it does is it has a more accessible type of palette. So if it makes it more accessible, so if, if people in your audience uh, have color blindness, you can make it more accessible by using like this specific palette right here. And all you have to do is just change it. The book talks about the many different palettes that you can use. If you wanted to, you could also change the shape of the scaling. So here in cylinder, I'm going to append a different shape to each one. Here you go. Now you can see for cylinder, I have different shapes. So you can change that as well. To be honest, this plot getting a little messy for me, but you know, hey, your data may necessitate this many colors, this many symbols, whatever it may be. The other thing that's nice about the scale kind of color families is you can do manual. And so if I wanted to use SpongeBob's color palette, what I can do is I can go online and I can find that specific color palette and I can provide the specific hex code. So if anybody's 
interested in, in getting very specific types of colors, you can type in hex code colors. Um, you can find the specific hex codes. So all these hex codes represent is just a specific color. And so I just went online, I typed in hex codes for SpongeBob. And so I got the four different colors. And I'll be honest, I'm, I kind of like this color palette. You know, I'm not a big fan of SpongeBob, but the color palette actually looks pretty good. So if you want to change the different colors and be very specific, you can. And how you do that is you just do that scale color manual. But I've actually, I actually thought this was probably the best plot of all of them that I created because it's just the color looks really good. But anyways, um, so some zooming examples. So going back to what I was talking about before, you don't really have to know too much about this because most of the stuff is just the same. But here's our original plot. Now the book highly suggests that we use chord Cartesian to set our limits. And so I do that here. And all this is the same, our original plot. And then we use this chord Cartesian to set different limits. And what we do is we set our Y limit. So our Y axis, what's the bottom value? What's the top value? And then our X limit, what's the bottom value? What's the top value? And if we run this, everything looks good. Now, what's important about this is that it didn't change our calculation of this model. So here up here in our original plot that's zoomed out, it has the same represent, representation of that model. It's just a zoomed in version of it. However, if we subsetted before we did this, before we did our, <clears throat> before our plot, what's gonna happen is it's gonna change our model. Does anybody wanna take a, take a guess at why this is the case? Why does the model change between this plot and then probably do this would be a lot easier to see if I do it this way. Why is the model different between both of these? Same data, different model. Yeah, one of them cuts out a bunch of the values though. Right. Yeah, yeah, that, I mean, that's exactly correct. So basically what you're doing is the model is getting estimated. So GM Smooth calculates a model. Um, it's calculating this model based on this subset of data. So you gotta be very careful if you're gonna do some zooming, if you're subsetting or you're not. Here we don't, and we use Chord Cartesian to, subset, to do the zooming. Here we do subsetting before, and it changes our representation of the model. So you just gotta be kind of careful with that. That's why there's kind of that warning with that. Uh, we talked about themes, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this a little bit, um, <clears throat> but there's many different themes, many different global themes that are available to you. Uh, the ggplot package provides uh, many different examples of different themes that you can apply. Again, these are global themes. If you want to do individual pieces, you can. We talked a little bit about that. Um, if you want to modify individual components, which we talked about earlier, you can access this kind of theme information and see all the different options that you have available to you. Again, it's just, we just don't have the time to go over every single one. And then my other tip, and we've talked about this a long, long time ago, but look into this function called theme set. If you know you're gonna continually use the same theme over and over again for all your plots, <clears throat> excuse me, my throat's kind of dry tonight. You can do this theme set where you can set it at the beginning and it will be applied to all of your plots. So that's available to you as well. Any questions about themes? I know I, I rushed over that really quickly, but we've already kind of talked about themes. So, and we're getting kind of close to time and I want to make sure we finish because this is our last session for a while. So the last thing is saving plots. I think this is pretty intuitive. There's two functions, one called ggsave. Um, ggsave outputs your plot to disk. So if you're looking at putting it in a specific file or directory on your computer, you can use ggsave. 
Um, but if you're using our markdown, which we talked about last week, you can um, set these specific uh, these specific parameters or configurations in your code chunks. And you can have them output in your document that you're going to have outputted. Um, so just as a quick example, say I'm happy with my cool plot here. I'm going to call it cool caravan. All right, I'm happy with this plot. Let's look at it. Looks great. I'm going to get a promotion because of this plot. Excellent. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use GG save. If you don't include the actual name of the plot object, GG save defaults to the previous plot that was run. But what's nice about this is there's different arguments to tell it what file you want to, what file or directory you want to put it in. And then you can specify the height and the width, and then it gets outputted to your specific directory. So if I run this, cool. If I look at my files, I look for my 28 cool caravan PNG, pull it up. Here it is, pass it along, put it in a Slack message, whatever you need to do with it. Here's your plot with GG save. So, um, that's it. Congratulations. Very nice. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of good information. And I, like, and I keep getting exposed to this stuff and realizing how much more I need to go in and dive dive into all these topics so thank you colin anybody else have any comments or thoughts or questions or anything yeah i think his example is really illustrating the point especially this one like i, I really like this one yeah i mean oh go ahead sky oh yeah long time ago i want to like uh, i was thinking about how we can do only like uh illustrate one point in a graph. And I was never got a chance to do it, but now I saw how you do it. <laughs> yeah, the way I kind of think of it is like layers, right? You're just layering things on. And when you have a layer, you kind of have to create a separate object that gets that represents the layer. And so, you know, that's you know, that's super important with this is just kind of knowing what your layers are and, and how they're represented. I think it's cool. As soon as you see it, it makes it so much, you see somebody do it, it makes it so much easier to go and like research it and learn how to do it yourself. So it's awesome. I think, I think with the book too, the book was also saying like going back to the top of our conversation to start like good graphics or good plots, like um, the book can't go over everything that makes a plot good. Like you can write an entire book, you can have an entire class on what makes a plot good but it can talk about the specific mechanics. So if you've seen that it can be done, you know it can be done and you go, go look it up and find the mechanics to actually do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, good. Well, we only got a couple of minutes left. So um, maybe there's a couple of, of words to say of thanks, at least from my perspective. I, um, started, I started this book club, if you want to call it that. I started it in like December because I knew there was so much